on World News Tonight. Deadly crush. Multiple casualties have been reported in Pakistan following a stampede to get food. Bakhmut falls. Russia's Wagner Group flies the Russian flag over Bakhmut in a victory that was a long time coming for Russia. Dollar's downfall. The OPEC Plus nations agreed to cut down oil production by 2024 as the BRICS nations vote to abandon trading use the US dollar. And Ambani's might. Mukesh Ambani organizes a red carpet event that featured the might of Hollywood. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're watching the first rendition of World News for the month of April. Now first in India. Indian opposition leader Rahul Gandhi is set to appeal against his conviction and jail sentence in a criminal defamation case. He was sentenced to two years in jail by a court in Gujarat state for 2019 comments about Prime Minister Narendra Modi's surname at an election rally. The Congress leader was also later disqualified as a lawmaker. Opposition leaders have accused the governing Bharatiya Janata Party of a political vendetta. The BJP has denied this, saying that due judicial process has been followed in the case. National elections are due in India next year. Mr Gandhi will not be allowed to contest until his sentence is suspended or he is acquitted in the case. News reports say Mr Gandhi will appear in court in Surat City with his sister Priyanka Gandhi Vadra and other top Congress leaders. Congress workers have gathered outside the court in support of Mr Gandhi. Several videos show protesters holding banners with the words Save Democracy on them. A senior police official told news reporters that a large number of police personnel have been deployed in Surat. A member of Mr Gandhi's legal team said that the politician will also ask for a stay on his conviction in a sessions court. A decision in his favour would reinstate his place in parliament, while one against his appeal can be challenged by his lawyers in a higher court. Mr Gandhi is currently on bail after being given time to appeal the judgment, which was passed on the 23rd of March. Nirav Modi is a fugitive Indian diamond tycoon, while Lalit Modi is a former chief of Indian Premier League who has been banned for life by the country's cricket board. A deadly stampede occurred at a food distribution site in Pakistan's Peshawar where a massive crowd gathered for free food. Police used tear gas, gunshots and dis to disperse the crowd and at least 16 people were killed in the incident. A crowd of frightened people fled a food distribution site in Peshawar, Pakistan on Saturday as gunshots rang out behind them. One of several such incidents in recent weeks amid what officials said was the country's highest inflation ever recorded. Police said officers resorted to using tear gas and firing their weapons in the air to disperse the crowd, which the country's food minister said had gotten difficult for the government to control. At least 16 people, including five women and three children, have been killed in stampedes at flower distribution centers across the country. The distribution sites have been set up to help ease the impact of soaring inflation, which has jumped to a record 35 percent. Mohammed Shoaib, a retired factory worker who had come to get free flour in Lahore, says he cannot afford a bag of flour, which has gone up to 1,160 rupees. He says his pension is 8,500 rupees and he has no other means of income. The stampedes underscore people's desperation in the face of soaring costs, made worse by Pakistan's falling currency and a removal of subsidies agreed with the International Monetary Fund to unlock the latest tranche of its financial support packages. A monthly economic outlook report issued by the finance ministry on Friday projected inflation would remain elevated. The head of the Russian private military company Wagner, Evgeny Prigozhin, has announced a milestone achievement in the battle for the city of Bakhmut. Evgeny Prigozhin said that his troops involved in a months-long effort to encircle and capture the bombed-out city had raised a Russian flag on its administrative building. But there was no indication from Ukrainian officials that Bakhmut, a town of 70,000 before the Russian invasion launched over a year ago, had fallen into Russian hands. Prigozhin has previously made claims that were premature. The battle for Bakhmut has ever emerged as one of the most intensive and bloody engagements of the armed conflict in Ukraine, with both sides reportedly suffering significant casualties. Western officials have claimed that the city poses no strategic military value, but Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky pledged to defend it as long as possible after proclaiming the city a fortress. 
Kyiv's attempts to hold on to Bakhmut regardless of the losses had almost destroyed the Ukrainian army, Prigozhin claimed earlier this week. However, Wagner fighters who led the charge to capture the Donetsk People's Republic city also took a serious beating. A well-known Russian military blogger was killed in an explosion at a cafe in St. Petersburg in what appeared to be an audacious attack on a high-profile pro-Kremlin figure. Vladlen Tatarsky died when a blast tore through the cafe where he was appearing as a guest of a pro-war group called Cyber Front Z. Authorities said that they were treating the case as suspected murder. A well-known Russian military blogger who championed Moscow's war effort was killed in a bomb blast at a St. Petersburg cafe on Sunday. The explosion injured dozens of other people in what appeared to be the second assassination on Russian soil of a figure closely associated with the war on Ukraine. Vladlin Tatarsky has more than half a million followers on Telegram. Russia's TASS news agency said the bomb was hidden in a miniature statue handed to him as he addressed a group of people in the cafe. There was no indication Sunday night as to who was behind the blast. However, Russia's state investigative committee said it had opened a murder investigation. Tatarsky's real name was Maxim Fomin. He was one of the most prominent military bloggers that championed the war in Ukraine, while also being critical of Moscow's top military brass. The group has enjoyed broad freedom from the Kremlin to publish hard-hitting views on the war, now in its 14th month. Last September, Tatarsky was at a Kremlin ceremony attended by hundreds to proclaim Russia's annexation of four partly held regions of Ukraine, a move rejected by most countries as illegal. In a video from that ceremony, Tatarsky said, quote, We'll defeat everyone, we'll kill everyone, we'll rob everyone we need to, everything will be as we like it. On Sunday, a member of Russia's Wagner mercenary group said that he, quote, would not blame the Kiev regime for Tatarsky's death. The Russia-installed leader of the occupied part of Donetsk pointed the finger at Ukraine for Tatarsky's death without providing evidence. Meanwhile, a Ukrainian presidential advisor said domestic terrorism was breaking out in Russia. The blogger's death follows the killing of Daria Dugina last August, the daughter of an ultra-nationalist, by a car bomb attack near Moscow. At that time, Russia accused Ukraine's secret services of killing her, while Kiev denied involvement. The historic decision to file charges against Donald Trump means prosecutors are now navigating uncharted waters, legal analysts have said, which could create opportunities for the former U.S. president's defense. Trump is now set to speak in Florida following New York arraignment. The office of former U.S. President Donald Trump says he'll speak in Florida on Tuesday following his arraignment in New York City. Trump is expected to be fingerprinted and photographed in a Manhattan courthouse as he becomes the first former president to face criminal charges. He's set to fly from Palm Beach to New York Monday, where he will spend the night at Trump Tower before his court appearance the next day. On Sunday, Trump asked for contributions to his 2024 re-election campaign in a video post to Truth Social, his self-founded social media platform. If you're doing poorly because of Biden's disastrous policies, don't even think about making a contribution to our campaign. You and your family always come first. Our movement is about making your life better and putting you first. So I don't want you to incur any financial costs that you can't afford. But if you're doing well because all of the things that I've done have brought you wealth and prosperity, or at least you're extremely comfortable, it would be really great if you could contribute to our campaign. You know how to do it. Trump was arraigned in New York after an indictment by grand jury that heard evidence on hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Trump describes the probe as a political witch hunt. Some of his top supporters, including Republican lawmaker Marjorie Taylor Greene, say they will go to New York on Tuesday to protest. Officials at the Manhattan courthouse said they will shut down some courtrooms ahead of Trump's expected appearance. Trump lawyer Joe Takapina told on Sunday he plans to move to dismiss the charges. But he stopped short of doubling down on Trump's claim that the judge in the case, Justice Juan Merchant, is biased. Merchant also presided over a criminal trial last year in which Trump's real estate company was convicted of tax fraud, though Trump himself was not charged. Trump's office said he will fly from his arraignment back to Palm Beach Tuesday evening.
where he will speak from his Mar-a-Lago estate. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Iranian women condemned a recent attack of a man dumping yogurt on an unveiled mother and daughter in a shop believed to be in Shandiz near the northeastern city of Mashhad. Iranian women are now at risk of arrest for not covering their hair. The viral video of a man dumping yogurt over the heads of two unveiled women at a dairy shop in Iran sparked condemnation from Iranian women on Sunday. In Iran's capital, Tehran, 16-year-old Malika, who did not provide a surname, said it was not the man's place to confront the women, a mother and her daughter, for not wearing a hijab. You can't throw a tub of yogurt on a woman's head and think you did something great and to guide someone in the right direction. It's that person's business. She wanted to dress like that, and she dressed however she wanted. It's no one's business. But after the attack, President Ibrahim Raisi reiterated that wearing the hijab is the law in Iran, adding, quote, if some people say they don't believe in the hijab, it's good to use persuasion. This woman, who did not disclose her name, blamed the Iranian government for the incident, saying, quote, if the government did not cause such discontent among its people, then they would not rise up against them. Growing numbers of women have defied authorities by discarding their veils after nationwide protests that followed the death of a 22-year-old Iranian Kurdish woman in the custody of the morality police for allegedly violating hijab rules. Security forces violently put down that revolt. Judicial authorities issued arrest warrants for the man and state media said the two women were also the subject of arrest warrants for flouting Iran's strict female dress rules. As for the owner of the dairy shop who pushed the attacker out of his store, Authorities said he was warned for confronting the man. Reports on social media said his shop had been closed, but he was quoted by a local news agency as saying he had been allowed to reopen and was due to, quote, give explanations to a court. Saudi Arabia and other members of the OPEC plus oil producers announced that they will voluntarily cut oil production in an effort to support the stability of the oil market. This is expected to lead to a rise in oil prices and further strain ties with the United States. Members of the OPEC plus made up of major oil producers and Russia have announced their price cuts of around 1.16 million barrels per day. Saudi Arabia state media said Sunday that the country will be cutting its oil output by 500,000 barrels per day, starting next month, until the end of this year. The Saudi Energy Ministry described the move as a precautionary measure, aimed at supporting the stability of the oil market. It also explained this is in addition to a reduction announced by the OPEC plus nations last October, when they agreed to an output cut of 2 million barrels per day that angered the Biden administration. To deal with soaring oil prices following the war in Ukraine, the U.S. has been arguing that the world needs lower oil prices to support economic growth and prevent Russian President Vladimir Putin from earning more revenue to fund the war. Iraq also announced it will cut oil production by 211,000 barrels per day starting May. The UAE, Kuwait, Algeria and Oman will also be making cuts in oil production. The Russian government also says Sunday local time that Moscow would extend a voluntary cut of 500,000 barrels per day until the end of 2023. Analysts say the latest move from the oil producers is expected to push up oil prices, which are currently at about $80 a barrel. The head of investment firm Pickering Energy Partners told that prices could jump by $10 per barrel. Dozens of wildfires broke out across South Korea over the weekend with efforts to extinguish them continuing into Monday morning. Major blazes were reported in the country's central areas, including the capital Seoul's in Sangwon Mountain. The Korea Forest Service reported more than 30 forest fires across the country on Sunday amid strong spring winds and warmer temperatures causing humidity levels to drop below 20%. Fifteen of the fires have been extinguished, but two of the biggest fires, in Hongsung County, roughly 110 kilometers south of Seoul and just south of the city of Daejeon, have both been classified level three emergencies, the highest fire alert. 
Relevant authorities have been ordered to make all-out efforts to put out the blazes, but firefighters are racing against winds that are speeding up the spread of fire. The challenge to extinguishing the fire is the strong winds, both yesterday and today. The strong wind is causing the wildfires to spread quickly, especially faster in the valley. Also in central Seoul, a large forest fire broke out on the slopes of Inwangsan just before noon on Sunday, which quickly spread to the northern side of the mountain. As of Monday morning, 98 percent of the fire has been contained, but winds are hindering it from being extinguished completely. Authorities have banned entry to the mountain, with some 120 residents in nearby areas being evacuated, but there have been no reports of deaths or casualties. South Korea has been under a dry weather advisory for some time now, with cumulative rainfall in Seoul only reaching 67.3 percent of rainfall in recent years in the first three months of 2023. The last time it rained in Seoul was roughly the 5.6 millimeters of rain that fell in the capital on March 12, which makes it over 20 days without a drop. The United Nations Environment Program has projected that climate and land use changes would make wildfires more frequent and intense, with the number of wildfires rising by 50 percent by the year 2100. And South Korea is no exception. South Korea remains under a special dry weather warning, although there is some positive news with rain in the forecast early this week. Patrick a Titan Merum, a dinosaur giant belonging to a group known as Titanosaurs, is visiting Europe for the first time since its discovery in Argentina in 2010. Over the five meters tall and weighing over two and a half metric tons, its skeleton will give visitors an idea of what this gentle giant, which could have weighed as much as 57 metric tons and stretched over 120 feet, would have looked like when it lived on Earth around 100 million years ago. Even by dinosaur sizes, this one is off the scale. It only just about fits in London's National History Museum. Going by the name of Patagotitum majorum, the titanosaur measures 37 metres long and roamed the earth around 100 million years ago. We know that Patagotitum was a herbivore and it would have probably been eating about 130 or more kilograms of food per day. This is an animal that was going from an egg around the size of a large grapefruit to an adult in about 30 years. So it's putting on a huge amount of bone and muscle in that time and growing incredibly rapidly. The replica was cast after an Argentinian farmer came across a massive thigh bone sticking out of the ground back in 2010. That original bone is also part of the exhibition. It's one of the first uh, signs that the scientists who made this discovery were on something incredibly special because alone this bone is 2.4 metres long and weighs the fossil weighs about 500 kilos. In real life, the titanosaur would have weighed around 57 tonnes, making it just too heavy to put the original skeleton on display. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Max Verstappen won the Australian Grand Prix after two late red flags and a slew of crashes through the race into chaos before a processional victory lap around Albert Park. Lewis Hamilton, who came second, broke an all-time F1 record of soaring podiums in every year present in the sport. Scientists have broken the world record for the deepest fish ever caught as well as the deepest fish ever filmed on camera. A juvenile sailfish, part of the Liparidae family, was filmed in August 2022 in a depth of 8,336 meters, beating the previous record in the Mariana Trench by 158 meters. Former principal of an ultra-orthodox Jewish school in Australia was found guilty by a Melbourne court of sexually abusing two former students. After a six-week trial, a jury found 56-year-old Mal Khalifa guilty of 18 offences including rape, indecent assault and sexual penetration of a child aged 16 to 17. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen arrived in Belize to embark an official visit to one of its only two remaining Taiwanese allies in Central America. Tsai will spend three days in Belize where he is scheduled to meet Prime Minister Johnny Brissino. Hail showers hit the northeast Texas town of Hearst as the National Storm Prediction Center warned of severe weather in parts of north and northeast Texas around Dallas and Fort Worth, including large hail, significant wind gusts and a strong tornado or two. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, 
You can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. And we leave you tonight with Hollywood star Zendaya and American supermodel Gigi Hadid wearing glamorous Indian saris as they walk the red carpet at the launch of Indian businesswoman Meeta Ambani's Culture Center. Stay safe and have a good night.